to see you, Nicole Bart. Look at your beautiful face. I'm sorry <laughs> that everyone can't see you on Zoom right now since this is audio, but thank you for joining me here. Oh, thanks for having me, Kim. It's so great. <laughs> you know that I really just want to be with you in person having coffee. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> that would be my favorite, but this will have to do for today. Um, Nicole, for those who do not know you yet, I can't imagine why they have not, but we're just going to indulge that. Tell us who you are. Tell us who fills your house, your beautiful house that I can see <laughs> in the background and what fills your days. Who yeah. Are you? Oh my goodness. That's a really big question, Kim. I don't Sorry. Know where to start. <laughs> How long do you have? Like three hours? A long time. So long. The dog's in the kennel. The kids are off doing something. Take your time. Yeah. Oh man. I, you know what? First and foremost, I'm a mom. And I think that's, that's the thing that rises to the surface when people ask me who I am and I'll tell them about my kids. I've got five of them. Um, the oldest is 18 and living in Boston. He's flown the coop already. Um, and then we have 17, 15, 14, and 10. And I tend to get so wrapped up in that and in them that yeah. at the end of the conversation, I go, oh yeah, I, I, I also, I write, I write too. I write these books. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, I identify yeah. with that. And really your yeah. kids probably think mom first as well. I don't know about oh, your totally. kids. Yeah. When my first book came in the mail, none of my kids believed that I wrote it oh. because they hadn't seen me doing it. And so Mark was yeah. like frantically having the moment of encourage mom, encourage mom. And they all looked at me blankly, like how, when would you have done that? So he had to show the photo on the back of the book to prove it. Oh my to goodness. Them. <laughs> so you probably have the same, right? I mean, most of your life, most of your hours are with your kiddos. Yeah, they really are. And when I'm writing, they're not around. They're at school or at different activities. So they never see it happen. They just think, I don't know, magical writing fairies come <laughs> right. and do my job for me or something. The most innocent yeah. double life ever. You <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So five kiddos, you have a delightful husband, Aaron. I do. Yes. He's pretty fantastic. Yeah. And you've been married how many years? Uh, 22 years. You yeah, that's look crazy. 22. So that's Aww. really hard for me to believe. <laughs> no, that's, that's not blowing smoke. You just really, I'm waiting for you to age. It just hasn't happened yet. You so are too sweet. You let me know. <laughs> you let me know. Okay. So I cannot wait to talk about your new book. I'm holding myself back. So just know Thank that's happening, you. but I want to ask you, I would love to hear, was the dream always to write? Because this is your 10th book, Sister yeah. and Friend. <laughs> 10! Uh, I know, it's just crazy. Have champagne right here to toast you. Was that always the dream? Did you, were you, are you an author that you grew up thinking, oh man, you know what I'd love to do? I'd love to be a writer. Was that your, your road? Yeah, absolutely. I, I have a story. Do you want to hear my story? I would love to hear the story. Are you kidding me? Yeah. So I, I was born with a birth defect that sounds tragic. And I guess it kind of was because I had a lot of surgeries between the ages of three and 16, mm. um, 14 surgeries between three and 16. And oh I hated them. They were so traumatic. I mean, this was happening in the early eighties. Now you know how old I am. Yeah. Um, and they just didn't take care of kids in hospitals the way that they do today. No. So I would go in the night before. I always knew it was surgery time because my mom would break out the um, chicken broth. And that was my supper that night. And I'd oh. start to cry and I'd be oh. so horrified. And lots of needles and lots of trauma and taking me away from my parents when I was mm. too young to really understand what was going on. But and you're right. There weren't multicolored, beautiful. There wasn't no. artwork on the walls. There wasn't a wing. You were basically a mini patient that got yes. the same care as the 60 year old coming in for bypass. Right. Um, absolutely. And often I was right next door to the 60 year old, you know, right. which is great. Everybody needs to be in the hospital. But when I was, you know, four and five and six and not understanding what was going on, I didn't get, you know, the elderly man beside me who was crying. And that was, mm just really traumatic for me as a little girl. So my saving grace uh, was my parents. And the night before surgery, my, my dad, usually he's kind of the person who instilled a love of reading in me, but he would go to the library and he'd get a bag of books. So then when we would arrive at the hospital, what was going on. I could sit in his lap. He would wrap a blanket all the way around me, sometimes just straight even over my head and just read to me. 
And I felt like I could escape what was happening around me by just diving into this book and really feeling what was happening. And yeah, it was, it was what got me through. He would read so intently to me that as they would come and put me on the gurney to take me to the operating room, I mean, they're taking me from my parents. I'm screaming, I'm crying, but he would grab the book and walk beside me as far as he could oh, until Nicole. they went through the double doors. I know. <laughs> that is just a beautiful picture. I mean, yeah. of a lot, right? I mean, what a beautiful grace filled moment because he knew yeah. what you needed. He did. Yeah. It, it was, good it was pretty special. He's such a good man. And my mom too, they both just did what needed to be done, you know, the day before tablets and mm. phones and hand right. and computers. So yeah, books were really my saving grace. And I actually very distinctly remember thinking, um, I don't even, I don't know exactly what book it was, but my dad finished it. He closed the cover and I didn't want it to be done. And I remembered thinking, well, maybe mm. I could write more. Maybe mm. there's more to this story. And I didn't even know that I was doing it. But when I was really little, I was writing fan fiction. Oh my I'd, gosh. <laughs> I'd take the end of a story and I'd just keep going with it sure. because I didn't want to leave those characters behind. So yeah, I have literally wanted to write since I was maybe four or five years old and wanted to tell stories ever since then. So, yeah. so this idea of books being um, kind of a coping mechanism, right? Uh, books yeah. coming into hard places and allowing us to take a deep breath. Has that continued for you as a mom? Do you, I mean, that's a beautiful picture of your dad coming alongside <laughs> you, but yeah. when your kids were little and maybe even now, particularly during the last year that we've had, yeah. has that been something for you or story, or maybe it's not in a book? Absolutely. I, I work really hard or I worked really hard to instill in my kids a love of reading. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel Tell a little me bit about that. Than... Tell me about yeah. that. How do you do that? Cause I know there are lots um, of moms and dads who love that idea, but maybe don't know how to do it. Yeah. I, it's really basic stuff. I think, I don't think there's, you don't need to have a degree or anything to teach your kids to love books. But I think the number one thing that parents need to get out of the way is this feeling that my kids need to be reading something important or good or age appropriate. I don't even care about age appropriate. Every once in a while, my teenagers will pick up like a big Nate because it reminds right. them of their childhood and they love it. And it makes them laugh and they read totally. it in half an hour. Totally not, you know, age appropriate. Who cares? Right. They're reading, they're loving it. They're engaging the story and the characters. Mm -hmm. So I just, I let my kids explore. We go to the library once a week, whether they like it or not. And sometimes they're like, I don't want to go. But then when we get there, <laughs> they emerge happy. with a stack yeah, of 20 books. Um, I think it's really important that they see, that kids see their parents reading right. and that they have access to books. So we keep them on, I wish I could show you my house. There's like books on every available surface practically. Mm -hmm. So at any point in time, if you sit down and, and need a minute, you can pick something up and start mm. flipping through it. Um, and then we're really intentional about like screen time and media too, making sure that, that they're turned off, that our younger kids don't have access at all. We're super old fashioned. Our kids don't get um, a phone until they're a teenager. So <laughs> they yeah. really have no choice but to read. Yeah. Uh, our our yeah. children are quasi Amish. Yeah. So it's such a disappointment to them. All three of them have been really disheartened that we are just one step away from a buggy, but <laughs> I just keep saying, listen, when you're 30 and you're thinking about this with a little bit more of a frontal lobe, I just want, yeah. then you can tell me if I did this wrong, it's completely, totally possible. But at this Absolutely. point, you know, we're just going to try it. And you're right that when you take that away, they are left to different devices. And usually those devices are, are books. Yeah. So there are worse things, right? <laughs> I figure they have the rest of their lives to bury their nose in an iPhone or whatever, <laughs> totally. or, can, or complain yeah. to their therapist. That also will probably happen, but for sure. Um, okay. So you were always, you are always a writer. You're a writer at heart. Um, I wanted to be Amy Grant. So you had a lot, <laughs> you had a much more uh, doable goal, but even, even that goal is just kind of crazy, Nicole, right? I mean, most yeah. people, you and I've talked about this actually, that there's so many folks who talk about wanting to write a book and that that's a part of their heart that someday they're going to write a book. And the vast majority of people don't do it. 
they do maybe a chapter, maybe a brochure length, and then they stop. You have not stopped. And I'm positive that there are times when you have wanted to stop. So when you're looking at a crazy dream like that, when our listeners are thinking about a crazy dream, how have you continued to walk forward in that? How have you, how have you decided that? Yes, it's crazy, but I'm going to try it anyway. Yeah. Oh, that's such a great question. Um, it's really, really hard. I think people have this idea that I've got this great idea in my head and I'm going to sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil and, and beauty is going to pour mm-hmm. out. And that's just not true. Right. I, like you said, I've written 10 books. Now I, I added up the words and it's over a million words oh for gosh. publication at this point in time. That you know, is that's phenomenal. Crazy. That's wonderful. Good girl. Yeah. Thank you. But every word hurts. Like every word is hard mm. and every book is hard. And I really did believe that once I reached a certain point, you know, Malcolm Gladwell in his 10,000 hours, yes. once you've completed this, I feel like I have spent that amount of time in my writing. Therefore, I should be an expert at this by now. I should have it figured out. And my last book, the book that's coming out in November that we're going to talk about pretty soon was the worst book I've ever written in my life. I rewrote mm. it three times, like from scratch, scrapped everything and started over because I, I think oh, I got just hurt no. me physically. I have also I been know. down that road, but three, ah, oh, that's a yeah. lot of rewriting. So your yeah, million but- words does that, that count doesn't even take into account the other two hacks at this, right? Oh, I mean, no. I think, I think you're right to say to folks, I, and I, I know you, and I've seen this over and over with beautiful aspiring writers who have this dream and they hit the first speed bump and think, well, I must not, maybe I shouldn't do this. You know, the muse is not falling, right? Oh, I keep no. sitting down and that's nothing's happening. I don't, I don't like what I'm writing. And you and I, and our friend Tosca, <laughs> we all make eye contact and say, no, that's, that's just a Tuesday, right? Yes. Yeah. So getting past that Tuesday, what do you do? How do you do that? Yeah. Forget the muse, do the hard work. Any Uh, job that you work in is going to require you to learn your craft, to hone your craft, to spend time researching and reading. So many people that I run into who want to write a book don't read. hmm. And that right there to me is a deal breaker. If if you're not a reader, you can't write. Hmm. So you better be burying your nose in books. You better be trying to learn about the craft as much as you can. When you try and fail, okay, that's all right. I learned something. And then you move on to the next step and just keep grinding away. And it is a grind. I hmm. I don't think literature and, and movies have done a very good job of portraying the inner life of a writer because they make it look so, so fun. You know, we have our smoking jacket, we have our scotch, we have <laughs> fancy pens and paper, and, and that's just not how uh, it is. All it takes is a yeah. couple really late nights by the beach, by candlelight, <laughs> and you got that. You've got that novel. No biggie. I totally yeah. agree. Right. And your hair still looks good and you have a little lip gloss on in the morning. Yeah, oh, not, for sure. not quite. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> so this book, um, you mentioned that it was hard one. I'd love for you to talk about the difference between writing book one and book 10. What have you learned? I mean, you've mentioned already that there were three huge passes with this manuscript. And I had the great honor of being with you one morning <laughs> when you got yeah. an editorial letter that said, basically, we've got some, we've got some work to do. And that is just so soul crushing as a writer, when you've poured yourself into these 70, 80,000 words and your editor says, "Mm -hmm, let's start over or, (laughs) oh yeah, that's, it's not quite there. And I think even if you're not a writer, you can identify with that, right? You're standing on the precipice of feeling like, Oh, I'm done. I did this thing and I'm done. And then you figure out, Oh gosh, you're not yet. So talk to us about how, how you sit in that moment, what you do with it, and maybe how you did that at book 10 in comparison to how it would have felt with book one. Yeah. So that morning with you, there were tears. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there should be, this is personal. It's Mm -hmm. agonizing. It is very personal. You are taking a piece of your heart and soul because in every book that you write, you are infusing your character, your view of the world, your view of humanity and your desire to, I I think, 
not necessarily teach a lesson, but to show something to people and right. say, hey, look at this. This is something that I want to talk about and engage in this conversation with, with my readers. So the process from my first book until where, where I am now, um, <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing when I wrote my first book. Same. None whatsoever. <laughs> I was, yeah, mid twenties. I had one little baby. I thought I had the whole world figured out and I did not, not even close, but I wrote this book. Um, I had never read a craft book. I had never gone to a conference. I had never really done anything, but I credit my ability to finish that book with the fact that I had been a reader since I was two, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I, kind of inherently grasped what it should feel like and what the character arc should be. And, mm -hmm. you know, roughly where there's going to be a climax and how it should finish off. Oh, I should also mention I was an English teacher. So I, I did study this stuff, I you guess. You had a little, not, you had some street. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm not giving myself enough, enough credit for that. <laughs> Remember that it. part of your life? It was a while. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. You <laughs> earned that part too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I just wrote it. It was a really joyful experience for me. And I didn't, you know, they talk about the difference between plotters and pantsers. Do you plot your book or do you fly by the seat of your pants? And I completely flew by the seat of my pants and wrote this book. And it just so happened that the editor who got a hold of it loved it and it worked for her. And there was something in the chemistry between the two of us that um, made this book something that she wanted to acquire. So I have a bit of a Cinderella story with that one. But after that, they wanted me to keep producing books and keep producing books that that were good, that sold, that people wanted to read. And I, I feel like I had to teach myself how to write after I had already written and published a book and kind of start over from the beginning. Because mm -hmm. of the truth of the matter is, once you're in the publishing industry, they're not interested in same old, same old. And they don't want you to maintain whatever status quo you've established with the first book or two everyone has to be a little bit better mm -hmm. and everyone has to be a little bit different and it's got to, you know, push some boundary or take you to some new territory. And so you're constantly innovating and, right. and trying to find ways to do that. Yeah. I don't think we're unique with that. I, I mean, I watch my husband's work and I watch my friend's work and I think there is, um, I think we just live in a spot where maybe it's cultural or maybe it's just where we are in our, um, the season of life. But I, I don't feel like there's a lot of room to just tread water. And while that is um, a scary feeling and it puts a little bit of a burden on us, there can be a lot of joy there too, because we also want to keep that, keep that um, upward swing. Oh, yeah. So when you get an email that says, mm, it's not there yet that can just stop you in your tracks a little bit. And I'm so glad Nicole Bart that you did not stop because I love this book. You know, that I cannot even handle how fangirl I am about your books <laughs> and I love all of them, but this one, I could not, I neglected my whole life. I just read and read and read and my kids would come in the room and they'd say, <laughs> typically I don't sit that long unless I'm feverish. And they would look at me and say, are you okay? And I was like, I'm reading Nicole's book. Stop talking to me. It's so wonderful. It is so, the characters are just people I know and hold on to and won't let me go. I would wake up in the morning and start thinking about these people. That is that's such a coup, right. In such a loud world for me to enter in and then just not want to leave. So you did such a good job. These beautiful renderings of the Midwest. And I just, I just want you to know this is such a special book and I'm so excited for people <laughs> to get their hands on it and for it to just Aww. fly off the shelves. So congratulations. Congratulations Thank on you. not stopping that mo that morning. Cause I know that's the temptation, right? Yeah. If you're going to have to start over, you kind of think, well, how about I just start all the way over and you yep. did not. I oh, think so I had a, I had a little bit of time there where I was going to quit writing completely and go work in the co local coffee shop. Oh, friend. <laughs> I always say bank teller. I'm always like, yeah, oh, people get to go and then they just help people all day and then they go home. And there's no right? like existential question about it. They just do it. Sounds so good. Coffee shop sounds so good. Right. I get to hand people their latte. Who doesn't And they love, love you. Yeah. I know. And they don't write an Amazon review saying, I can't believe she gave me a latte. Like, right. But you didn't. Aww. Yeah. 
Thank you. you. Think that you means- could though, Nicole. I mean, don't you think that's just, this is just part of you. I don't know if you could let it go. No, I couldn't. There's no, no. way. And I, I've come to that realization that I, th- and this book was the one, this book was mm-hmm. the one that really taught me that even if I gave up my career and I walked away and I'm not there, mm-hmm. but if I did, I would still never stop writing. I'd mm-hmm. still be writing for my family or for myself. I journal all the time, but man, I just always have a book that's playing in the back of my head. Yes. It's always percolating whether I want yeah. it to be there or not. So even your Instagram posts, posts are beautiful language. So I just don't think, <laughs> I don't think you have it in you to walk away. If you need a reminder on book 11, just call me. Oh, um, thanks. So this book is set in a small town in Iowa. You have, you have tra- traversed that road before in other books and you do it so beautifully. You live in a small town in Iowa. And there were times that I gasped out loud when I read this book, because your writing is fearless and it's just, um, so free. And I'm wondering if that's hard to master when you live in a town where everyone knows your name and what you do, you write with honesty about what it feels like to live in a small town, both the beautiful parts and the broken parts. And I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit because we're all creating in different spaces, right? And for some of us, I hear from lots of writers, aspiring writers who say things like, I need to tell this story and I don't want to hurt anyone. Yeah. So people writing memoir who say, this was, this is an important part of why I'm writing this book, but I don't want to injure the people around me. So how do you navigate that? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, I've been writing for 15 years now. And in the beginning, that was such, such a sincere um, concern of mine. I never wanted to hurt anybody. And even when my first book came out, that's also about a small town. And I felt like I had been pretty honest about that. And I thought, I don't, there's certain people that I'm not sure I want to read this because I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want them to think that, um, my, my characters are not me, right? I think sometimes people believe that when an author is writing, the main character, the protagonist is an extension of that person. And sure. that is just not the case at all. <laughs> so yeah. being able to separate myself from the story and say, look, I'm, I'm telling a story. It's not necessarily my story, although I am going to mine my own experiences in order to tell this story well um, and accurately. I, I think having some distance has helped, but I also think growing older has helped a little bit. What I was concerned about in my twenties and thirties, I'm less concerned about now. And I'm really interested and desire to have deep engaged conversations with people about the beauty of maybe our community or our church or our relationships, the things that are happening around us, politics even, to have real conversations with them that are honest and that are possibly hard. I remember being a kid and my dad and mom <laughs> go back to my parents often. I had, I had great parents, Kim. You They're just you the best. still do. They're I great. did. Yeah, <laughs> they're great. Uh, but one of the things that we would do is we'd sit around the dinner table and we'd have conversations and my dad would very intentionally play the devil's advocate. So whatever we were talking about, he would just throw this wrench into the middle of the conversation and let it sit there. And we would get mad and we would be very heated and, and, it, and we'd yell and, and then we'd call them down and at the end of the meal, we'd, you know, do dishes together and be happy as can be and go for a walk or whatever it was. And I feel a little bit like we've lost the ability to do that today. We can't, we can't say anything uh, without our feelings being deeply, deeply hurt or without putting people in these binary camps, you're left, you're right, you're black, you're white, you're right, you're wrong. And there's, there's very little in between. So I guess, I guess maybe there's a little bit of courage that I'd like to see come out in our writing community and in our artists to be able to say some of these things and, and be able to have these conversations honestly without destroying people's emotions or perceptions of, of what we've written. So far, your dad has 18 tally marks in the awesome department. He taught you to love (laughs) books. He taught you to deal with struggle and he taught you how to have uncomfortable conversations. What a gift. What a gift that I want to give my kids, right? That you just have, and you use the right word, the courage to walk into those conversations and to love people well within the conversation, even when you do not end up on the same spot. 
and then to walk away still loving that person. I mean, what a beautiful thing he gave you. And I have watched you giving that to your kids too. So what happens though, my question is what happens after the book comes out, you have the hard conversation, you write the memoir about a scene or a person or an experience that just hurt you deeply and now could hurt someone else deeply. And even when you've done it in love, you are misunderstood, right? Yeah. We are often misunderstood. So how do you navigate that? Oh man, <laughs> uh, we've, we've dealt with a lot of that actually. My husband and I have, um, we love our small community so, so much, but there is, there are dark corners. There are hidden issues um, that we deal with. So I honestly don't know how to answer that question very well because we're still in the thick of it to a certain extent. So it it's hard, it's painful, but we we try in grace to continue to navigate them. And when we are misunderstood, say, I'm, I'm sorry that you feel that way. I'm sorry that you don't understand. That's not my heart. And there are people around me who, who do understand. Mm. And I think, I think that base of people who, who know who I am mm. and know that it would never be my intent to harm someone, to hurt them, to drag them down in any way. Um, I just, I want to have conversations and the people around me who know that um, continue to affirm that in me. And mm. I don't know, it's, I, I think sometimes we're called to stand in hard places and, we don't, we don't do that very often anymore. We want to be comfortable all the time. We want everybody to like us. We want everything to be, you know, easy and happy and comfortable. And, and I don't necessarily think that's what we're called to. I think we do a lot of growth when we stand in those really hard places. So I don't necessarily like it, but I try to stand there anyway. And I should say, I don't always do it well. Like there have been times that I have said or written or done things that have been too blunt, too hard. And, mm -hmm. and then I've had to repent and say, I'm so sorry that I hurt you. That was, mm. that was not my intent, but I see how I did and, and try to do better next time. We're, we're human, right? <laughs> Absolutely. At least at my house, we are, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So you, you use, um, thank you for being so thoughtful in that response. And, um, I know because I know you, but also because of how you write and even how you repent that you use that word, but that you do that honestly, that faith is just such an important part of who you are and, um, informs how you write. Talk to us a little bit about that. How has faith intersected with creativity? Um, and I'm thinking in particular about writing, but you and I both have written in the Christian fiction market yeah. and also in the mainstream market. And you and I've talked about how, we kind of feel like fish out of water in both of those spheres. Yeah. So how does your faith inform your writing and how can you, can how can we allow our faith to inform what we're doing on the day to day in all of our work? Because I know there are a lot of writers listening and a lot of people who are thinking about writing books. Um, and that question comes up a ton. How, yeah. how do I let this be an organic thing that comes out in my writing without feeling like I'm pressured into writing a sermon? or a yeah. Bible study or what have you, where, how have you landed on that? I have struggled with that my entire career from the day I picked up a pen um, to write for publication until today, I'm still thinking about that and just ruminating on it, trying to figure out um, how do I honor God um, with my writing? But like you said, not necessarily write a sermon. It's, it's hard. So actually I've come to a word in the last, oh, in the good. last week. I know I kind of can't believe this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want it to give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> the word that I am hovering on right now is witness. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been called to do. We're called to do that. And I think it's Isaiah 43, one through 13. That's one of the passages that I've really been focusing on. Um, and then again, in the new Testament, when, when Jesus says, you will be my witnesses, you know, in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth and witness is kind of where I have stuck recently, because I feel like especially in Christian circles, especially those of us who were growing up in the eighties and nineties, the idea of witness was here's a pamphlet, go stand on a corner and tell totally. people that they're going to hell if they <laughs> totally. don't repent. Totally. Yeah. Witness was a lot like bludgeoning or yes. <laughs> self-punishment. It was a, that's a loaded word. So I'd love to hear how you have reclaimed that or see that yeah. in a fresh way. Well, and I, I, I think the idea of, of bludgeoning people was probably a part of the, um, 
CBA, the Christian Booksellers Association Mm. years ago. I don't think that's necessarily the case anymore. I've been out for many years. Um, But when I started writing the CBA, they really wanted there to be a pretty strong faith focus, which I totally understand. And there is such a great um, community of people that love to read those books and want to read those books. And that's fantastic. They're totally, totally welcome to do that. It wasn't right for me um, to be speaking quite so overtly anymore because I felt like I was preaching to the choir. Mm. And what I wanted to do and what I can give words to now is I wanted to witness to people who probably didn't necessarily understand why I would do the things I would do, why I would believe the things that I believe and do it in such a way that it's invitational, not Mm. that I'm banging them over the head with verses or things that they have to say or do in order to be saved or repent or burn. but just to talk about the beauty of God working in my life and the way that I'm seeing him in, in the day to day and get people curious and soft and open Mm. and maybe asking questions. And I I think that's the best thing that we can do is say, look what God has done Mm. for me. Right. And hopefully invite people to, to want to be able to say that themselves. You're in very good company with this. Um, Jesus, (laughs) <laughs> was a storyteller, right? I mean, yeah. I always look to him. He did not hang out a lot in the temple. He hung out with people around a campfire and on a hill and told story over and over and over. He used story to teach us about who he was and teach us about the character of God. So it feels right as a human being to use story to illustrate something bigger. Um, and you do that so beautifully. And this book is no exception. I mean, it's Thank just you. drenched with redemption and forgiveness and hard places that become freeing places. I mean, I'm telling you, Nicole, <laughs> I cannot wait for people to read this book. It's so good. And I have yeah. to say, Nicole, you write beautifully about motherhood. Has anyone told you that before? No. <laughs> I'm so glad that I'm the first and the smartest because (laughs) you do not just in this book. I mean, I have vivid scenes still imprinted in my head of past books where you have just kind of unraveled beautifully the, the relationships between particularly, um, mothers and daughters. You just do that so well. Um, and I'd love to hear here. There's a beautiful spot in everything you didn't say. Have I said the name of that book yet? <laughs> everything you didn't you say, did now. people. Oh my <laughs> gosh. I didn't say everything you didn't say. Um, okay. There is this beautiful line in everything you didn't say. You say motherhood was an art form, a complicated, intricate dance. First of all, well done. That's a beautiful <laughs> turn of phrase. But the mom in me, my heart leapt a little bit. You know, we have three children, Mark and I, and they're always kind of, I feel like I'm always doing this dance of figuring out who they are in this particular moment, in this stage, we're getting ready to launch our eldest to college. And so I identify with that idea that it's this complicated and intricate dance. And you go on to say that this particular character felt like that she like felt like she has never learned the steps. And so I would love to hear how that works in the Bart house. Do you feel like that, that it's a dance and that it's intricate and it's changing and complicated? Are you now that you're however many years into parenting, do you (laughs) feel like, Oh no, I've got it down. Like, how do you approach that? Um, both you and Aaron, how does that work? Oh, parenting is the hardest job I'll ever have. Writing is hard, but parenting is even harder. Oh, you know, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, Kim, and I tend to read all the books and listen to all the podcasts and follow all the people and, I'm constantly trying to learn and try to refine my art because I do Mm -hmm. think that mothering parenting in any form is, is isn't art. Um, It's, it's difficult. I, I've been a mom now. Let's see, we've grown our family through adoption. So my oldest biological son. So when I became a son um, or when I became a mother, he's 17 years old now. And if I could do it all over again, I, I would probably start over and try again, because I know so much more now than I did back then. And some of the things that I did as a young, you know, 20 something mom, I wouldn't do anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah. I've grown we and I've learned, <laughs> we know better. Right. I know. And yet I think that, I think that there's something really beautiful in that too, because we're learning right along with them. Right. And I feel like our kids grow up in this hopefully grace-filled 
home where they understand, yes, we make mistakes. And when we do, we can ask for forgiveness and, right. and hopefully make it right. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to write a parenting book anytime soon. I'm, <laughs> I'm no good at it. I feel like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I totally hear that as Anna's getting ready to go, um, to college, Mark and I will, you know, lie awake at night and say things like, did we teach her how to change a tire? <laughs> did we teach her how to balance the checkbook? And yes. there are those like, you know, kind of mundane things. And then with enough silence, I, I will say things like, okay, tomorrow I have to tell her that I'm sorry that I wasn't quick enough to apologize all the time. Or, you know, I'm so I'm yeah. telling her tomorrow we have to tell her, we're sorry. We have been horrible about observing the Sabbath. We've completely failed on that count. <laughs> so we're adding up all these things that we really, and every single time when you talk about grace and filling your house with grace, she, we're now in this moment where she's extending grace to us. And she's saying over and over after rolling her eyes, you guys, you did fine. Right. Uh, you, you did what you need. You did do what you needed to do. Right. And we're, we're all learning. And I, that is such a balm to my heart because I think, okay, first of all, she must have seen that at some point. I don't know if it was me or a pastor or someone who really has their act together, but that's what I want for her. I want for her and for my other two to get to a point where they say, oh my gosh, you really, really dropped the ball, mom. And I am, I'm okay. You yeah. know, I'm okay. This cushion of grace is big enough to, to catch us all. So, um, beautiful writing about motherhood, but also beautiful living Nicole. I have seen you live this beautifully. So oh, thank you. Um, I'd love to ask a couple more questions for folks who read books and love them. And then maybe even love authors too. What is your best advice for how to support an author? Oh, that's a beautiful question. Nobody ever asks that question. I'm so excited. I've asked about motherhood. I forgot yeah. to say the name of your book, but I am asking a couple questions. <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> oh, you know, I there's a lot of things that you can do to support your favorite author. If you if you can, if you can afford it, buy their book and especially pre-order it. So okay, talk about did, that because yeah. I think people hear that, but they don't really understand what it means and how much of a boon it is to a book and to the person who wrote it. So everything we didn't say comes out on November two, and any orders that come in before that, tell my publishing house and tell the buyers, the retailers, this is a book that people are interested in. This is a book that people are buying and it's going to drive the numbers that they send to the actual print shop <laughs> and what gets printed right. and what gets put out there in the channels. So pre-orders are absolutely huge for authors. They help so very much. Um, but I know that not everybody can afford to buy all the books of all the authors that they love. Um, my right. bookshelves are literally overflowing. Um, so I know that there are other people who have that same problem. So other ways to support an author are to follow them on social media, uh, engage with them, share their content. And then this is a huge one, write a review. If you mm -hmm. loved their book, let the whole world know by writing review. And I think people are intimidated by that because they think it has to be, you know, they're thinking back to their book review days of like high school and college. When they mm -hmm. had the to write three pages worth. No. Yes. This is <laughs> a five not point a essay. No, 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 no. Keep it simple. Tell right. us what you liked about it um, and who else might like it. And that's totally. pretty much it. Those two sentences two are, count for a review. Yep. One. Yep loved it also counts for a review. <laughs> I mean, Absolutely. really, yeah. And you know what, that is such a gift that keeps on giving those reviews are up forever and ever. Amen. Yeah. And so, um, yes, if you respond to a book or love a book or love an author, that's just such a sweet and simple, super quick way to yeah. show your support of her. Um, and just one more note on that pre-order business. That has become increasingly important also in terms of lists. So like bestseller lists, yeah. those are really, really important months coming up to the release of a book. I remember my total horror um, early on when I had probably a sales and marketing person at a publishing house said to me, you've got about six weeks after the book comes out and then it's dead in the water. Oh. We turn our attention to something else. In fact, six is probably generous. So if you love an author, a beautiful thing to do is to 
put the flag in the sand and order that book early. And, you know, another way to do that is to call your library and ask, request them to acquire that book for, for the shelves. We'd like you to buy it first and then call your library. But, (laughs) you know, again, all of those orders say to a publisher, oh, people are paying attention to this and it affects the print run. So absolutely. Yes. Amen. Pre-order. Um, my final question for you, Nicole Bart. I know you are such a book girl. One of the many reasons I love you. And so I'd love for you to leave us with two recommendations. First, a book that you find yourself recommending year after year, month after month, something that you have just loved. And you don't have to actually limit that to one because I always feel like that's unfair for a person who loves books. (laughs) And then I'd love to know about a book on your nightstand that you haven't read yet, but you're excited to dive into. Absolutely. Okay. The ones that I love, you know, over and over. Always. Always. Uh, Peace Like a River by Leaf Anger. Oh, so it, good. It's so good. It's it's old as far as we're way past the six week mark on that right. one. <laughs> so like, but probably 20 years old, 15. Okay. I don't know. You know what I'm going to say about that? <laughs> and my hope for this podcast, honestly, is that we would just completely ignore the six week because I have yeah. books all over my shelves just like you were mentioning that I return to over and over and pull them off and say to my friends, have you read peace like a river? You've got to read it. And so I have such a heart for authors who are beyond that six week mark and still want to talk about their books. So we're just saying it right now, six weeks, it's dead to us (laughs) over here. I love it. That's great. Perfect. Yes. Perfect example. Peace like a river. Fantastic. Next. Yep. My next one is the night circus. Um, Erin Morgenstern. Yes. Am I saying her name right? I think it's Morgenstern. Yes. I love a little bit of magical realism and the night circus probably goes a little beyond magical realism into straight up magic, but I have such a soft spot for fantasy or that just something that takes us a little bit outside of our world. I didn't I, know that about you. No. I love it. I love that book too. <laughs> it's totally. beautiful. It's so good. Mm-hmm. Um, and one that's on my nightstand that I haven't picked up yet, but I absolutely can't wait to is the secrets we kept by Lara Prescott. Did okay. I say her name? right? I don't know. I'm writing it down. Yeah. And this, these cl- will be in the show notes too. all y'all who, who are writing or in their minivans right now and not able <laughs> yeah. to write them down. So the secrets we kept. Yes, I believe that's the title. And Lara Prescott, um, I think that's how you say her name. It is about a Cold War, um, female spies during the Cold War who smuggle Dr. Zhivago back (gasps) into Russia. I know, doesn't that sound- Okay, is this a novel or a memoir? Because I think they did that. Yeah, yeah, it's a novel, but it's based on the real- yeah, it's based on what actually actually happened. happened. (gasps) Yeah, I love it. That's a great recommendation. Fantastic. Nicole, thank you for taking time to talk with me in your beautiful sun-filled porch. Thank you for writing an exceptional book. Again, number 10, I just pray you're going out to dinner to celebrate this because it is just such a magnificent novel and I'm so excited for people to be able to read it. So good work. Thanks, Kim. Good that means the world to me coming work. from you. <laughs> oh, you know what? I just find you to be a beautifully tenacious woman who is strong and humble. And I think those two, that's what I tell my girls all the time. If you pair humility and strength, you are unstoppable and you absolutely embody that. So thank you. Thank you for joining me. (laughs) Godspeed. And I can't wait for people to get your book. Thanks, Kim. It was a delight. 